Hey everyone, I wish I could be with you guys today. Um, it is Sunday actually right now and I am about to leave to go to Missouri because I have a, a family thing that just came up. Um, but I didn't want to lose the momentum in chapter 14 that we are flying with. So I want to just do notes today in class. So hopefully I'll make the video long enough that we'll just kind of go through notes and do a little bit of lecture. And then tonight for your homework, I'm going to post something on your blog and it, it should already be posted now for you guys. So if, if the video gets over with early, then you can just start it as soon as the video ends. But it's going to be some practice problems doing things with um, rate laws, with reaction rates, and then also with some of the things that we're doing today, which are the kinetics or reaction mechanisms in an actual reaction. We'll talk about how in a reaction there can be multiple elementary reactions or like single little step reactions that will build up to the full reaction that we see occurring. Um, and then how do I know if one's a fast step? How do I know if one's a slow step? And how do I write a rate law for that? So that's our focus today. And that's what your homework will mostly be over um, that is posted on your blog. Whatever's posted on your blog, I would like you to try to have all of that done for tomorrow we can go over them tomorrow, and then for the rest of the week, I just want to do tons of practice, tons of AP practice with things in Chapter 14 that you may see. So the last thing that we looked at in your homework um, video was a reaction coordinate diagram, and I actually think that that cut off, uh, I think that that cut off like mid sentence on the on the next slide. So in a reaction coordinate diagram, remember all we're doing is visualizing what's happening in the overall reaction. So we had some key jargon that we needed to know for these diagrams, and that is where is the activation energy, what's a transition state, and what's an activated complex. So the highest point on a diagram that we can see is right here is called the transition state, and that's just where the activated complex is going to be present. So an activated complex, I want you to kind of think about it as like an intermediate. So what happens in between this kind of breaking apart into forming something new? So it's like that step that's happening in between the reactants and in between the products. So we call that the activated complex. Um, that energy gap that happens between the reactants and then that highest peak, that transition state, that's your activation energy. So that's the amount of energy that we know we need to overcome before we can start to form the products. This is a big misconception, and a lot of people miss this on a multiple choice question on the AP test, because they assume that it's to this total amount of energy change that we see here, but activation energy is really just that amount of energy where my reactants currently are to that amount of energy that I need to supply to break whatever bonds I need to break here. Now, the red arrow that we see down here, that delta E, that's the overall change in energy. And that change in energy tells me if a reaction is going to be endothermic or exothermic. And it doesn't necessarily tell me what's going to happen uh, if the reaction is going to happen. It doesn't necessarily tell me um, anything about the reaction rate. So activation energy from reactants to transition state versus whether or not it's endothermic or exothermic, that's going to be the change in energy between uh, reactants and then the products. We have seen this before, and we are just only giving it a name now. So Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. We talk about the number of molecules, a fraction of molecules, versus the kinetic energy on the x-axis. With the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, we have seen this a couple times. I think mostly in um, thermodynamics, or if we're talking just about like energy. So the uh, temperature we know is just the measure of average kinetic energy that uh, molecules in a sample are going to have. At a higher temperature, that means that we should have a larger number of molecules 
that are at a higher kinetic energy if the temperature is higher. So this dashed line here is representing activation energy. It's representing the minimum amount of energy that's needed for a reaction to occur. So at a higher temperature, we have a larger number of molecules at a higher temperature, which have a higher kinetic energy. So that means that if I have more molecules that are at a higher temperature, that means more molecules are going to be able to reach or overcome that activation energy. So because of that, we know that as temperature increases, then reaction rate should also increase. So again, dotted line is just representing activation energy. So as temperature increase, increases, the number of molecules that I have with a higher kinetic energy also increases, meaning that I have more molecules that can overcome that activation energy or overcome that minimum amount of energy that's needed for a reaction to occur. And as a result of that, the reaction rate has to increase. So we've seen this in a couple different chapters. And... I like this because that just means that we can relate it to so many different things. Now, Maxwell Boltzmann created a way or came up with a way that we could re that we could find the fraction of molecules in their relationship to activation energy and temperature. So a formula to find the number of molecules that would need to overcome a certain amount of activation energy is this right here. So F is just going to stand for those number of molecules that's going to be equal to E to this particular uh, power here. E sub A is going to be our activation energy. R is representing our ideal gas constant. And T is representing our temperature. But that temperature, as it says here, needs to be in Kelvin. So a lot of times... We don't necessarily like to use that one because it doesn't give us very much data. Arrhenius came up with a way that we could relate activation energy with the rate constant. So remember that K is just representing our rate constant. And he wanted us to, sh he wanted to show that for most reactions, the increase in rate with increasing temperature is a non-linear type of relationship. And he shows that with this equation here. K is representing the rate constant. A is, uh, is a value that he came up with, and A is just what he would say is the frequency factor. Um, frequency factor is really just the, the fraction of collisions that occur based on an appropriate orientation. So we're assuming he made up this a factor that says, if I have all of these molecules within a sample, then let's assume that this specific amount of time, the, the molecules are going to be oriented in the correct way when they collide. So that's his frequency factor that he'll call A. Um, and then we already see that E to the negative activation energy divided by ideal gas constant times temperature here. So he feels that a reaction rate, or mathematically describes, I should say, that a reaction rate has to be based on really three variables. Um, one of those is the fraction of molecules possessing energy the same as the activation energy or greater. Another one is the number of collisions per second. And then also the fraction of collisions that have the appropriate orientation. And those three factors are really shown here in this equation. So we have our rate constant, we have our temperature, and we have that activation energy. As the magnitude, let's just talk about some relationships here based on this reaction. So as the magnitude of activation energy increases, K is going to decrease because the fraction of molecules that possess the required energy is going to end up being smaller. So as we could say as reaction rate decreases, activation energy increases. And that should make sense to you as well because if I have if I have to overcome a really large amount of 
activation energy, then the reaction rate is going to be slower because there's more, I have to apply more energy to get over that giant hill to make that chemical reaction happen. So that is at least shown mathematically in Arrhenius's equation. Now, I've not seen, this used to be on the curriculum a long time ago, I haven't seen a question like this. I didn't see a question like this last year. From the conferences that I've gone to so far in AP Chem for the past two years, I also haven't really heard very much about you having to use this equation. It's not on your constants page or your formula page. I do, however, think just in case it's one of those one crazy questions that they want to throw out there, you should know this equation. Okay, let's conceptually utilize activation energy um, in, in terms of kinetics and energy profiles. So let's consider the series of reactions with the following energy profiles. Rank the reactions from slowest to fastest, assuming that they have nearly the same value for the frequency factor A. So I have three different energy profiles here. I have... Uh, number one, number two, number three. So right now, take just like a couple seconds, look these over, and tell me which one do you think would have the slowest? Uh, tell me which one you think would go the slowest in terms of its reaction, and which one would go the fastest in terms of its reaction. Okay, so this question is a little tricky in the fact that they are throwing in a couple different pieces. Remember I told you on that last slide that change in energy is not important, but activation energy is important. So my goal is to figure out where is the activation energy on all three of these peaks. Well, activation energy for number one is going to be from here to here. So 15 kilojoules. The activation energy for number two is going to be from here to here for 25 kilojoules. The activation energy for three is going to be from here to where the reactant started here. So 20 kilojoules. <clears throat> the faster the reaction rate means that it's not going to have to overcome as much energy. So... If, my, if I need to figure out, I have to rank them from slowest to fastest. So that means the slowest one is going to have to be the one that has the most activation energy for a reaction to overcome, which would be number two. It has 25 kilojoules that it's going to have to overcome before that reaction can happen. So number two is going to be the slowest. Now I want to find the one that has the next largest amount of energy that it's going to have to overcome. So I'm comparing 20 kilojoules versus 15 kilojoules. So number three is going to be the next one, which means that the fastest reaction rate based on these energy profiles has to be number one because it has to overcome the least amount of activation energy. The reason that this is tricky is because they're giving to you as well the change in energy between the reactants and the products. So... A lot of people would mix this up because they would take the total energy here, total energy here, total energy here, and then they would answer the question. But you're smarter than that because you know that the activation energy is the only thing that I'm looking at in terms of its reaction rate. So if, if I were to ask you which one of these are exothermic, which one of these are endothermic, you would say because products are lower in energy than reactants, this is exo, this is exo, this is endo because now... This is positive, and products are higher in energy than the reactants. <clears throat> okay, um, looking at Arrhenius' equation. So in that last video that you had for homework over our long three-day weekend was um, thinking about how I can find K or how I can find rate constant based on just a graph alone. And we like to do that because it's just an easy experimental way for us to find the rate constant really, really quickly. So again, we want to do this with Arrhenius' equation. And we can show that because remember that Arrhenius' equation is K equals 
E, uh, A, sorry, I need a, my frequency factor here, A times E to the negative E A, which is the activation energy, over RT. Okay, my goal is to get this in Y uh, slope intercept form. Let's get it in this form here. If I take the natural log of both sides, then I get the natural log of K equals, when I take the natural log of this, that means this expression is gonna come out. So I'm gonna be left with a negative um, EA over RT, and then that'll be plus the natural log of A. So this is what I get, and we just simplify it down over here, so that way we can see, um, we can see it pull out the one over T, and then that can become our x-axis here. So the natural log of K, which we'll plot on the y-axis, should be equal to a negative activation energy over the ideal gas constant. So this term right there should be what our slope is. And then we'll graph that on the x-axis, one over temperature, and then plus the natural log of the frequency factor. So I can determine the rate constant experimentally based on just temperature and what the rate constant is because I can find the slope. I'm going to have us cross this out of your slides. So this one I know will definitely not be on our AP chemistry exam. So I'm not worried about doing this one. Okay, so we'll just cross that out. Looking at reaction mechanisms. This is like the funnest stuff ever, guys. You'll be so excited to do this. Or maybe I'm just really nerdy and excited to do it. A reaction mechanism. So there's a sequence of events that describes the actual process by which reactants become products. Not everything happens in a single step. So a lot of times when we write an overall reaction like A plus B yields C, it doesn't mean that it just happens in one step. It could have taken several steps to get to that final product of C. So a reaction mechanism is the total process all of those single reactions that build up to make that one overall reaction, call that a reaction mechanism. So reactions, again, occur all at once or through several discrete steps. We call each of these single processes, we call them elementary reactions or elementary processes. So if something has, a two, if something has two steps, you're gonna call that elementary process one, elementary process two. Easy enough. And then I just posted these here because these are, we've seen this one before. Um, we have our reactants. It's gonna transform into an activated complex and then that's gonna give me my products. And then we're gonna deal with this reaction here in a couple more slides. Before we get into looking at the elementary processes that an overall reaction have, we also want to describe something that's called the molecularity of a process. Now, molecularity is, uh, tells us how many molecules are involved in a reaction or in a process. We have a couple different kinds that you can see here. One form of molecularity is to be unimolecular. Another one, you can be bimolecular. And another one, you can be termolecular. So take just a second and tell me what you see as, tell me a relationship that you see at least with unimolecular versus bimolecular versus termolecular. <clears throat> okay, if we have a single reactant, like I have here on the first one, I'm gonna call that unimolecular. So that means a unimolecular reaction is where a single molecule is involved in the reaction. A bimolecular process is going to show you that there has to be a collision between two different reactants. It could be the same reactant, so maybe I have two moles of NO, of nitrogen monoxide. Maybe those are going to come together and react, 
and that can still give me a bimolecular process. So bimolecular, I could see two different ones. I could have a collision between two alike molecules, or I could have a collision between two different types of molecules. But again, I have two, so that would be my bimolecular. Termolecular means that you're gonna have a collision uh, between three different molecules. So it could be, again, three of the same ones, and that's totally fine. Uh, termolecular could be between two of the same ones and one different one, or it could be between three totally different uh, molecules. So termolecular just meaning I need three collisions, uh, bimolecular meaning I'll have two collisions, unimolecular meaning that I really just have one single molecule that's involved in that reaction. Okay, so again, figuring out how a reaction mechanism works, it, it's really important for us just because it tells us which bonds are broken, which bonds are formed, and it really goes through the changes in the relative positions of the atoms based on the overall course of the reaction. Uh, if we focus on multi-step uh, multi reactions, like we're going to do right now, and this is the really fun, cool part of this chapter, kinetics, at least I think so, because they're just kind of like little puzzles, and they actually kind of remind me of like Hess's Law problems a little bit. So in a multi-step process, one of the steps has to be slower than another step. And you'll never find two elementary processes that move at the exact same speed. One of them has to be slower, and then one of them has to be faster. So then which one is the rate law or even the reaction rate dependent on? It has to be dependent on the one that's going the slowest. So our rate law has to be dependent on the one that's going slowest. Please, 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 let's just like, like highlight it, write it down, circle it, whatever you need. That is the biggest key for chapter 14 is that they're going to give you a multi-step reaction mechanism and they're gonna tell you, this is a fast step, this is a slow step. And then they're gonna ask you to write the rate law. When they do that, always your rate law is going to be dependent on the slow step, okay? Overall reaction cannot occur faster then the slowest step, we're gonna call that the rate determining step. You may also hear it as the rate limiting step. So let me write that one down too. You can also have the rate limiting step. Okay. So let's say for example, that you are given an overall reaction. Um, NO2 yields CO. Uh, I'm sorry, NO2 reacts with, here we go, NO2 reacts with CO to yield uh, nitrogen monoxide and carbon dioxide. Let's say that this is the proposed mechanism of this reaction, that it will occur in two different steps. So if we used kind of Hess's law idea and thought about adding these two up, we should, in theory, if we add these two up, get this overall reaction. And that's exactly what should happen. So on this, I have two NO2s on this side, one over here on the product side. So let me just cancel one of those NO2s out. I'm left with NO2. That's part of my equation. Um, I also have CO. So here's CO gas here. I don't see that over here, so plus CO. That's going to yield, I need NO gas, that's here. And I need CO2, that's here. But wait a second. Because what we just did, here's my NO2, here's my CO. I had NO2s alike on both sides. So I canceled those out. I had an NO here on the products and a CO2 on the products, but I have a, a species in that reaction, in both of those elementary reactions, that's present on either side of the reaction. There's a name for this, and I kind of want you to think about this as like that activated complex that forms. NO3 is called the intermediate. The intermediate. 
The intermediate is a substance that's formed in the first reaction, but is completely consumed in the next reaction. Now, it's not part of the products, and I can't think about it as a catalyst, because remember, catalysts aren't consumed in the overall actual reaction. Um, NO3, an intermediate, is consumed in the reaction. So in the first reaction piece, in that first step, I make an intermediate, and then in the next step, I consume that intermediate. So this process of forming NO3 has to occur to get this overall reaction up above here. Okay, so let's try this problem. Um, it says that it has been proposed that the conversion of ozone into oxygen proceeds by a two-step mechanism. And describe the molecularity of each elementary reaction in the mechanism below. Write the equation for the overall reaction and identify the intermediates. So we have three things that we're supposed to do here. Describe molecularity, write the overall reaction, and then also identify the intermediate. Since they asked me for the molecularity of each elementary reaction, well, if I look at the first one, the, uh, the molecularity, remember that just means if I have one of the reactants, it's a unimolecular. So since I only have one of them, this step has to be a unimolecular in terms of its molecularity. If I look at my next one, I have ozone and then just a, a single oxygen here coming together. So they're going to collide, meaning that it should be a bimolecular. Okay, so I've done the first piece. We've already described the molecularity. That piece is done. Write the equation for the overall reaction. So let me just pretend like I'm adding both of these up then. In this process, let's see what's on the reactant side of the arrow here. I have two ozone. I don't have any over here on, the, on either of the product side. So I'm going to bring down two O3. I have... An, a single oxygen and a single oxygen here. I'm just going to put a box around that for just right now. But since they're on opposite sides of the arrow, I'm not going to bring that down. And then lastly, on the product side, I have two oxygens here and another oxygen here. So that means I'd have three O2 on this side. This makes sense. I have six oxygen, six oxygen on either side. So the reaction is balanced. Overall reaction makes sense. But why did I leave this boxed in? They should have canceled, but why did I box it? I boxed it because that is your intermediate. So the single oxygen that we have created in the first reaction was completely consumed and used in the second reaction for us to produce oxygen gas. So our intermediate is just O. This is our overall reaction here. And we did our molecularity of both elementary processes. Maybe let's try another one of these. Okay, let's say for example, let me just give you like a crazy looking reaction. So that way I can just at least exemplify to you that it doesn't really matter. And if you don't know the names of these because they look really, really difficult, you can still know and understand them conceptually. I'm really sorry about my Promethean board pen, guys. It's definitely not calibrated by any means. Okay, let's say this is our overall reaction. Let me read this to you. It's MO, and then in parentheses, CO, subscript 6, plus PCH3 should yield MO, and then in parentheses, CO, subscript 5, PCH3 
that's all one big molecule, and then plus CO. Let's say that's my overall reaction. Okay. Let's say I propose or you are given a proposed mechanism. 